Hey, it's Mr. Shrum, and I am back again with one of these um, tutorial walkthrough videos. Um, just in case you get caught up on one of those problems where you have to input um, your own answer, whatever, I'll just walk you through the whole lesson, and then you can go through the mastery test on your own. But at least this way, you can look at the entire lesson all in one go. So let's get through this. Um, this is unit two, and we're moving on to photosynthesis and cellular, cellular respiration. So if you're thinking, what the heck is that? Well, we're gonna find out. Here's all the content. And if you wanna jump into the warm up, we can. Some people say that plants make their own food from the sun through the process of photosynthesis based on the law of conservation of energy. Is that description accurate? So talking to your average person, you can quickly notice that they're kind of on the right track about certain things, um, but maybe their, their vocabulary is not quite accurate or the science is a little more complicated than they're making it out to be. So a sample answer here is, no, it's not exactly accurate. Um, the law of conservation of energy states that energy can't be created or destroyed. So the plants aren't making their own food. They're just transforming that energy that's already present in the light from the sun. And then they make that, they're transforming it. They're taking the light energy and making it chemical energy through photosynthesis. And then they're able to use that as um, food, right? So they're not, they're not creating energy out of nothing. They're transforming energy into another form. So that's technically correct. Technically correct is the best correct, the best way to be correct, I guess. Uh, yeah, science people, they're very, they're very particular about the way you use words. So in this next question, cellular respiration is the process that converts nutrients into ATP. And that is short for adenosine triphosphate. Uh, that is a storage molecule that provides energy for the cell. So which statements is true about cellular respiration? Cellular respiration, I don't know why that's so hard for me to say today, but plants perform photosynthesis and cellular respiration. There, I got it that time. So through the process of photosynthesis, plants transform light energy into chemical energy and then they perform cell cellular respiration, which uses the chemical energy for various life processes. And we'll learn about that more in the slides to come. So photosynthesis, here's a nice little diagram. We got the light energy from the sun shining down onto a plant. We have chlorophyll that traps light energy and then we have chloroplast that does the converting of light energy into sugars. We see that oxygen is being released into the air as a byproduct. So through photosynthesis, oxygen is expelled into the air. Um, glucose is stored in the plant to be used as food. So this you'll You'll become familiar with this, this uh, glucose um, thing uh, to come, yes. And then water is, is both stored in the plant and then the root, that's where um, it absorbs water. And then we have carbon dioxide from the air and the plant intakes that. So. That's a good little diagram to get used to and understand all the different pieces of the puzzle and how it all fits together. 
So a rumbling stomach around lunchtime lets us know it's time to eat. Humans are heterotrophs. And if you remember what heterotrophs mean, Heterotrophs are organisms that need to consume or ingest organic substances for energy. And that means we need to regularly take in energy from food to maintain our body functions. Uh, try to go a few days without food and uh, you're not going to make it. So don't do that, right? Plants, cyanobacteria, and certain protists, such as euglena, are autotrophs. And autotrophs, they are defined as being able to form its own nutritional substances to be used for energy, such as through the process of photosynthesis. So these organisms can transform radiant energy, that light energy from the sun, into a form of chemical chemical energy that they can use. So photosynthesis is how they do that. So we need to, we need to find things that are already in um, a, a form of energy that we can use, but these guys can make their own, which is very cool. Very cool. So energy transformation and metabolism. Uh, if you've ever heard that word before, we'll, hopefully this uh, explains it for you a little bit better. In an ecosystem, energy isn't created or destroyed. It's transformed from one form to another. And this process is called thermodynamics. Autotrophs transform radiant energy, radiant as in light, from the sun into usable chemical energy through photosynthesis. Then heterotrophs like fungi, some forms of bacteria, protists, and animals, that includes us, consume this energy by eating plants or other organisms that eat plants. So we have the sun, as the primary source of energy for the entire ecosystem. Radiant energy transformed into chemical energy in plants. Then these guys eat the plants that have the chemical energy stored in there. And then these guys eat these guys, these guys eat these guys, and this guy eats these guys, and sometimes these guys. Um, and then, oh no, excuse me. So then the fungi, right? The decomposers, they eat these guys when these are dead, right? So it's all a life cycle energy flowing in, flowing out, very zen, very give and take, right? Circle of life, if you will. Now we're going to look at metabolism. Transforming energy involves a series of step-by-step -step chemical reactions. Biologists use the word metabolism to describe all the chemical reactions that take place in a cell. They recognize two types of metabolic reactions. We have catabolic reactions, and those are reactions that release energy by breaking larger molecules Huh, excuse me, into smaller ones. So we have this larger molecule down here in this catabolic reaction. Those are being split up into smaller molecules and then energy, okay? Catabolic, large to small. Anabolic, anabolic reactions use the energy produced from catabolic reactions to build larger molecules from smaller ones. So we have anabolic, we got the small molecules and the energy combining into the larger molecule. Photosynthesis is an anabolic pathway. During photosynthesis, light energy from the sun, water, and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere chemically 
react to form glucose. Glucose is a form of chemical energy and oxygen, okay? So catabolic breaks things down, anabolic builds things up. Here we have a question. How have you heard the word metabolism used in daily conversation? How does this usage, usage differ from the actual definition of metabolism? So usually if you've heard this in I guess, TV, on the news, uh, in your day-to-day -day life, it's not quite the same. It's, it's more um, fitness related. Uh, people say metabolism as in their digest, di digest food and things along those lines. So this, this sample answer says, well, in ads for like exercise products or diet products, they claim they'll boost your metabolism to help people lose weight. That's, that's uh, it's like weight gain or weight loss is how that's used in day-to-day -day, um, terminology. But that is a lot different from the actual definition of cellular metabolism, right? That, that describes all chemical reactions that occur within a cell. And some of that's not necessarily anything to do with weight loss or gain but really the function of your body itself. So let's move on to this, this question. Now it says, watch this video. I can't do that on these uh, Zoom walkthroughs because last time I got copyright claims. So I can't go and watch that on this lesson, but I, am, I encourage you to go on this tutorial uh, watch the video and then answer the questions if, if you want. Um, but I'll show you the sample answer. The plants, algae, and many single-celled organisms can photosynthesize using a specialized cell organelle called a chloroplast. Now, humans do not have these chloroplasts. So, um, so the sample answer is no, not all organisms that photosynthesize have chloroplasts. Cyanobacteria are prokaryotes, so they lack most organelles defined by a membrane, and that includes chloroplasts, but they are still able to, pro to uh, photosynthesize. Fun fact. All right, so ATP. Um, if, if you've heard of that before, that stands for adenosine triphosphate. A living organism store chemical energy in the form of biomolecules. Organisms transform these biomolecules to other forms of energy when needed. So for example, chemical energy is transformed into mechanical energy when a muscle uses energy to move. Adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, is the most important biomolecule that provides uh, chemical energy. ATP is like a storage unit of chemical energy for the cell, and it's the most abundant energy-carrying biomolecule in cells. So if there's a storage unit of chemical energy in the cell, it's most likely ATP. It's pretty much everywhere in your body's cells. The structure of ATP consists of a nucleotide made of an adenine, adenine base. So we have the adenine base and then a ribose sugar and three phosphate groups. So you can see the phosphate groups here. We got the sugar and then the adenine uh, base, right? So the T in, in ATP is, is from the tri, and that means adenosine. There's an adenosine base, and then we have three phosphates. You also have adenosine diphosphate, and that means you have two phosphates, and then you have adenosine monophosphate, 
and that is where you only have one phosphate. Um, yeah, ATP releases energy when the second and third uh, phosphate molecules are broken, and then that forms adenosine diphosphate. And ADP can also form adenosine monophosphate, but that reaction releases less energy than the reaction that converts ATP to ADP. So when one of the phosphates uh, breaks up from ATP, that then becomes ADP. Mildly confusing, you say, you'll get the hang of it. Uh, just practice uh, using those in everyday terminology, look at those pictures, and hopefully you'll get a feeling for what ATP is. But ATP is the main one you gotta remember, adenosine triphosphate. Now, photosynthesis in plants, photosynthesis occurs inside chloroplasts. And we talked about that in that question before, but that is an organelle, a tiny little organ within a cell that allows for photosynthesis and plants and then some protists as well. The surface of plant leaves has tiny pores called stomata. And that stomata um, has little openings. Those little openings enable the exchange of gases, mainly carbon dioxide and oxygen within the leaf. These gases are important for photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Flattened sac-like membranes called thylakoids, right here is there's a thylakoid. Um, they lie stacked together in groups like this. And each group of stacked thylakoids, so you, if you stack them up, you call that stack a granum. granum. And the space between the grana, that's plural. So you have a coin looking thing, the thylakoid, and then you have stacks of those called granum. And then between those stacks, you have the stroma. And that's what you call the space between these stacks. So within the thylakoid membranes, there are light absorbing molecules called pigments. And these pigments absorb light of different wavelengths. The major light absorbing pigment is chlorophyll. And the abundance of chlorophyll in leaves make them appear green. Photosynthesis occurs in two phases. The first phase is a light dependent phase that must occur in the presence of light. And then you have your second phase and that's the light independent phase. This phase occurs during the day, but the reactions don't require the presence of light, right? So that first phase has to happen in light, in daylight, but that other phase, um, that can occur at any time. So let's get into that first part. So that first phase, the chloroplasts absorb light energy from the sun. Through several reactions, they then convert that light energy into chemical energy in the form of ATP and NADPH. Um, if you wanna say all that out loud, that could be the, you can say nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. But I prefer this. <laughs> um, now two processes, two processes, yeah electron transport and chemiosmosis, chemiosmosis, occurs at the same time simultaneously to produce the two forms of chemical energy. So let's look at electron transport first. 
thylakoid membranes contain two protein complexes called photosystem one and photosystem two. Now, these photosystems have chlorophyll. The phase begins with photosystem two absorbing light. So this, see this photosystem two, PS2? is absorbing light from the sun. The light energy transfers to an electron within a pigment molecule, okay? Next, this excited electron ejects out of the pigment molecule and an electron acceptor in the thylakoid membrane picks up the electron and transfers it through a series of proteins that make up the electron transport chain, the ETC. So we have light coming in to the PS2, photosystem two, that is then transferred to an electron within the pigment molecule, then it ejects out the pigment molecule, and then that is transferred through a series of proteins in the ETC all the way to the photosystem one. Light in, PS2, sends an electron through the ETC to the PS1 or photosystem one. Another reaction that occurs in the presence of light is the splitting of water. So the water molecule splits into electrons, hydrogen ions, and oxygen. The chlorophyll pigment that loses an electron regains its electron from the splitting of water. The oxygen generated as a waste product during photosynthesis comes from this splitting of water. The Positive hydrogen ions play a role in the formation of ATP during chemiosmosis. As the electron moves down the ETC, it loses energy. It arrives at photosystem one and its energy levels rise again in the presence of light absorbed by this photosystem. So the excited electron then moves to a protein called ferrodoxin, the final electron acceptor. And then that transfers the electron to the NADP, which accepts a, a hydrogen ion to form the energy storage molecule NADPH, okay? So that sounds like a lot, well, all you really need to remember is that an electron is transported through the electron transport system from one PS to another PS. Meanwhile, water is split as well. And all of this transforms energy into another form. Now, chemio, chemiosmosis is the mechanism that produces ATP. That occurs along the electron transport as well. The energy lose, or the energy lost by the electron while moving through the ETC powers those positive hydrogen ions. And those came from the splitting of water. And the concentration of these positive hydrogen ions, also called protons, increases in the thylakoid space, um, but not in the stroma, not in the spaces between them. The difference in concentrations creates a concentration gradient called a proton gradient. The protons diffuse, so they, they move out of the high concentration area to the lower concentration in the stroma through the channels in the membrane. So they go from an area where there's 
a lot of hydrogen ions and then they move to areas where there's not a lot of hydrogen ions, all right? And then through those channels they travel through, that is in the form of enzymes called ATP synthases, synthesis, synthase, yeah, ATP synthesis. And you can see that here. So yeah, a bunch of these hydrogen ions over here, and then they go through this ATP synthase, the enzyme. The enzymes go through this. And once they flow through this, their potential energy is used to add a phosphate group to ADP to form the higher energy molecule known as ATP, okay? And you can see that in this picture here. So the first phase is all about splitting and bringing things together to form ATP, all right? You take the light, you take the water, a bunch of stuff happens, and then you add a phosphate and a hydrogen proton, and that forms ATP. So think about that. ATP takes sun and water to form ATP. That is the end goal. Now, after that first phase, you have the second phase. And this phase is called the Calvin cycle. In this phase, the plant converts the high energy molecules, ATP and NADPH, into glucose. First phase, you get ATP, NADPH. And now in the second phase, you change those into glucose. These higher energy molecules, ATP and NADPH, are not stable enough to store energy for long periods of time. So the plant makes glucose, um, starch, sugars, and other carbon-based molecules to store energy. Plants obtain the carbon to create these organic molecules from carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere. This second phase occurs in the stroma of the chloroplast. And that means that takes place in the space between the um, granums, okay? And we'll learn about this cycle in the next few slides. So here we have the, Cal the Calvin cycle, CO2, sugar, chloroplast. Let's go. So the Calvin cycle um, goes through one, two, three steps. That first step is known as carbon fixation. This converts inorganic carbon, CO2, to organic carbon molecules. In this step, a chemical reaction transfers carbon atoms from CO2 gas to carbon molecules in the solid state. So they're moving carbon atoms from gas molecule to a molecule in a solid state. And that is called fixation. So uh, further in detail, we, we say, First, six five carbon molecules accept a carbon atom, accept carbon atoms from six carbon dioxide molecules. So, six unstable intermediate six atom atom, six carbon atom molecules are formed, and the six, six carbon atom molecules split to form 12 stable three carbon molecules called 3PGA, or phosphoglycerate, phosphoglycerate. So the main takeaway from this is you're taking 
CO2 gas and making it into a solid carbon form known as 3PGA. After carbon fixation, you have reduction. This second step is where the plant uses the energy from ATP and hydrogen ions from the NADPH. So in this process, these molecules reduce to form ADP and NADP. So they, they're losing something. And in that loss, the 3PGA accepts the energy from ATP and NADPH to form G3P. And then next, those G3P molecules combine to form glucose. Glucose is a simple sugar, and then they leave the chloroplast. Mo 10 molecules remain in the G3P um, within the chloroplast. And then lastly, we have regeneration, the final step of the cycle. And that is when the five carbon molecule uh, is regenerated. And then the remaining 10 G3P molecules react in the presence of an enzyme called Rubisco. And then that completes the cycle. The reaction that regenerates um, that molecule, RUBP, uses ATP. And then that gets converted to ADP. The ADP and the NADP formed during the Calvin cycle are taken up by the light dependent reaction. So some of this is a little complicated to follow. And I encourage you to slow down and just think about the overall process. So they're taking things in one form, changing it to another form, and then using that energy to do actions, okay? I'll skip this modeling activity. That was photosynthesis. Um, some of these lessons are getting very detailed, almost to a college level degree. And it's okay if some of these things are um, a little confusing for you because um, that's part of learning though. You're not always gonna be immediately able to wrap your brain around certain concepts. You need time to soak with them and understand them. And photosynthesis is mainly about transforming energy into one form or the other. That's the simplest way to understand what's happening. And then to dive deeper, those last few slides get very scientific and detailed into how that's the case. Now, I, I want you to mainly take away um, the transforming energy idea. And now we're going to look at cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is the process in which organisms obtain energy from glucose and other carbon compounds. Both autotrophs and heterotrophs go through the process of cellular respiration. The main product, the main ending product is ATP. The cells use the energy in ATP molecules to perform, to perform various functions. And then carbon dioxide is the waste product of cellular respiration. 
So this respiration occurs in two parts. The first part is called glycolysis. That is an anaerobic process that takes place without oxygen. The second part is called the Krebs cycle. It's aerobic and it depends on the presence of oxygen. So let's look at those two parts. Glycolysis, energy investment. Glycolysis is the anaerobic stage of cellular respiration. It occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. During the process, a six carbon glucose molecule splits into two three carbon pyruvate molecules. The first step in the process requires an energy input. And that energy input uh, comes from the energy from two ATP molecules. And that is used to bond two phosphate groups from ATP to the glucose molecule. Okay. So that's, that's energy investment. And then we have energy payoff. And in this step, a series of reactions produces energy in the form of ATP. Um, first, you have a phosphate group added to each of those G3P molecules. And then an electron carrier accepts electrons and hydrogen ions from the G3P to form NADH. And that's similar to NADP. And of the four molecules of ATP produced in this process, two molecules are required to start the process. So the net energy produced during glycolysis of a molecule of glucose is two molecules of ATP. So glycolysis, uh, that was glycolysis. And then after that, we have the Krebs cycle. While glycolysis was anaerobic, it didn't need oxygen, we have the Krebs cycle. And that's the aerobic part of cellular respiration. It's also called the citric acid cycle or the TCA. Um, the Krebs cycle doesn't directly require oxygen, but it requires products from the electron transport chain. And that is known as the ETC. And the ETC can only function when there is oxygen. So the Krebs cycle needs oxygen to um, complete the cycle. The Krebs cycle reactions occur in the mitochondria of cells, in bacterial cells, which don't have organelles. These reactions occur in the cytoplasm. The pyruvate uh, molecules produced during glycolysis enter the mitochondrial matrix and those guys react with the COA or the coenzyme A to form a two carbon molecule acetyl COA. And the reaction releases CO2. So you see how the parts fit together here in the mitochondria. So we'll go step by step through the Krebs cycle. Um, the Krebs cycle starts with the acetyl COA binding to a four carbon compound to form citric acid. Uh, then it loses two hydrogen ions and electrons 
And those guys move to NADH. And then a carbon atom is removed in the form of carbon dioxide. And that leaves behind a five molecule carbon molecule. A five carbon molecule. So one, two, three, four, five. Two is added to four to get six. And then one is released. Now we have five. Then this five carbon molecule gives up hydrogen ions and an electron to form NADH. And then the last of the carbon atoms from the, the uh, pyruvate molecule is removed in CO2 as well, okay? So it's losing CO2, it's expelling CO2. And then we have the formation of ATP. So during that second um, part where it's releasing CO2 again, we have another reaction taking place. And that is when ADP forms with another um, phosphate through the hydrogen and that forms ATP. So it's from, it goes from six carbons to five carbons, now to four carbons. And that loses a hydrogen and electron. And that's where the cycle ends. The oxidation, the oxidation rearranges the carbon atoms to form the original four carbon compound which ends the cycle. The ETC, or the electron transport chain, in cellular respiration, the electron transport chain is the final step in the breakdown of glucose. And the ETC produces the most ATP. NADH and FADH2 formed during the Krebs cycle transfer their high energy electrons to proteins in the inner mitochondrial membrane. In the process, NAD, FAD, and hydrogen ions are released into these uh, mitochondrial matrix. And then they re-enter the Krebs cycle. The electrons move through a series of proteins in the membrane. These proteins make up the electron transport chain. The electrons power the pumping of hydrogen ions out of the matrix and then enter the, into the intermembrane space where they accumulate to form a proton gradient. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor in the ETC. It accepts the electrons and combines with the positive ions to form water. So here we have the mitochondrial matrix. The proteins in the ETC are here. We have the intermembrane space where the hydrogen ions are released. Um, the process of chemiosmosis causes positive hydrogen ions to flow back from the intermembrane space and into the matrix through ATP synthase channels. As the hydrogen ions flow back, ATP synthase use, uses their energy to create ATP. The ETC chain makes 34 ATP molecules. Adding the ATP molecules created during glycolysis 
and the Krebs cycle, cellular respiration could produce a maximum of 38 ATP molecules. But this number is never quite reached during um, this process because of other factors. That can be because of membrane leakage and differences in efficiency of these ATP synthase. Cellular respiration produces around 30 ATP molecules. But the actual number actually differs between individual people, right? They have their own things going on. Now there is also anaerobic respiration. Some organisms and some cells and multicellular organisms are able to function without oxygen. They can produce ATP through glycolysis because it doesn't require oxygen but glycolysis provides only two net ATP for each glucose molecule. It also, it also uses up NAD, forming NADH. So without oxygen to run the ETC, NAD can't be regenerated from NADH. So if there is no NAD, glycolysis will stop. So how do they get around this problem? Well, they follow an anaerobic pathway to regenerate NAD. There are two types of anaerobic respiration or fermentation. So, excuse me, some organisms use lactic acid fermentation, while others use alcohol fermentation to regenerate NAD. Fermentation reactions occur in the cytoplasm. So let's look at some ex examples of this. Uh, yeast cells undergo anaerobic respiration to produce energy. So one way is lactic acid, right? Um, Lactic acid fermentation occurs in bacteria that produces foods like yogurt and cheese. It also occurs in your muscles, lactic acid buildup. That's when if you're working out very hard and your muscles start to, to burn, that is, um, that usually happens when the body is unable to provide enough oxygen to the area. So that's one way. Alcohol fermentation, uh, yeast added to make bread converts glucose in the dough to carbon dioxide and ethanol. Escaping carbon dioxide bubbles cause the dough to rise while ethanol evaporates during the baking process. So ethanol production, that can also be um, an example would be beer or something that is fermented like kombucha, right? Where small amounts of alcohol is produced. So this is the correct um, uh, diagram answers for this question. And then let's move on. So as a whole, plants tend to release more oxygen than carbon dioxide into the environment. But the ratios of gases differ at certain times of the day. Plants tend to take in more CO2 during the day and release more oxygen. At night, they tend to make or they tend to take in more oxygen and excrete more carbon dioxide. How does the model support this? Well, if you look at the diagram, the process of photosynthesis requires CO2 
for the chemical reaction and oxygen is one of the products formed. Because photosynthesis requires the sun, plants can only do it during the day when the sun is out. So during the day, some of the CO2 produced by plants during cellular respiration will be used for photosynthesis. But at night, plants can only perform cellular respiration. So the CO2 excreted during this process will be excreted by the plant. So during the day, it produces CO2, but then it reuses that to keep doing photosynthesis. But at night, there's no sun, so it can't do that first process. So the CO2 is just excreted. Then we're gonna look at science in the news, photosynthesizing animals. So the ability to transform radiant energy from the sun into usable energy certainly has a lot of survival advantages. The benefits it offers are so great that even a few animals have found a way to adopt the process. A handful of animals have evolved to have unusual relationships with algae, giving them the unique ability to photosynthesize. So let's look at two of these animals, the spotted salamander and a sea slug. Here we have a spotted salamander. The spotted salamander is the only known existing vertebrate that has the ability to photosynthesize. Scientists have known for a long time that spotted salamanders and algae have a mutualistic relationship. The salamanders and the algae exchange food and other resources, which allows both organisms to benefit from the relationship. But scientists recently discovered that salamander embryos actually had algae living inside their cells, which gives young salamanders the ability to photosynthesize. The algae remains in their cells through adulthood, enabling the algae to pass from parents to offspring. So that is a very cool example of a mutual beneficial relationship between the salamander and algae. Then there's the sea slug. And the sea slug feeds on algae. But instead of digesting the entire contents of the algal cells, it combines the chloroplasts, chloroplasts into its own cells. So the sea slug lines its digestive tract with the stolen chloroplasts, which give it the ability to perform photosynthesis. Scientists are still trying to understand how this phenomenon is possible. Typically, the sea slug cells would reject another organism's organelles because they're considered foreign, but that's not the case. So in this question, do you think uh, spotted salamander and Do you think the spotted salamander and the sea slug, the sea slug completely meet the autotroph definition? Well, the spotted salamander and the sea slug must eat algae or have algae in their bodies to benefit from the photosynthesis. They require a partnership with an autotrophic organism to have this ability. So they don't completely meet the definition of autotroph. They are still heterotrophs that have hijacked or adopted um, some autotrophic features. That is a summary video. And that is the end of the lesson for photosynthesis and cellular respiration.
um, very cool processes of transforming energy and using energy um, to perform various functions within your body. Uh, light energy transformed into chemical energy through uh, pretty complex processes. And then you have the cells using energy to perform various functions too. So very interesting stuff goes on in your body that you don't necessarily have, have any idea that is actually happening. So I hope you learned something from this lesson. And if you have any questions, message me on Canvas. I will try to help you as best I can. And good luck on your mastery tests. Good luck with everything else. And I will see you in the next tutorial. All right. See you guys later. Bye.